urban legends are a curious thing. Where I live, most urban legends come from the community as both warning and relic. Stories about the bodies of desaparecidos thrown into a ravine in Das Marinas, haunting the recollection area of a Christian school atop the cliff. Tales of controlled house fires in the metro, triggered by local government to clear out entire settlements in favor of building skyscrapers for the wealthy. They have a cynical tone to them telling of the times they were rocked from. And this is as real now as it was back then. Think of Carpio with his right foot still chained somewhere in the mountains of San Mateo Rizal. A legend from two centuries ago lasting the test of time as people await liberation. Think of Dayang Makiling turning into Mariang Makiling, still reverent thing to Lagunenses within the mountain area who benefit from her aid during hard times. And yes, I know these are legends from the countryside, but they still come into the metro because of a lot of reasons that would take hours to explain. What's really surprising to me, however, is the degree of tonal dissonance between the sources of these legends. Usually, there's a thread that goes through them that's a little recognizable if they're close enough to each other. In Asian countries, it's fairly common for urban legends to base entirely on the state of the nation as well as any pre-existing beliefs and mythologies. As said, they're usually cautionary, fictional or not. That's why the urban legends coming out of Japan sound mysteriously like Shintoist yokai, Korea's virgin ghost, and so on and so forth. There's a level of hush-hush due to reverence and fear of invoking the ire of something bigger than oneself. Then you get to the urban west, and maybe it is just because I'm Asian, but the amount of legends spoken about with more intrigue and analytical speculation than reverence and respect for the spiritual is unnerving to me. It's the same reason why I can't stomach true crime or just the general existence of grave diggers or people who buy and collect bones off of people's actual corpses. <laughs> it's not even talking about the fact that most western urban legends are of serial killers. Jack the Ripper, the Axe Man of New Orleans, Shotgun Man. <laughs> Often, these legends don't even have motive, as most people don't really have the capacity to understand the workings of someone who kills methodically, despite being countries that laud patriotic veterans sent to third world countries, of course. They're not defined by how they kill in this sense, but who. Jack the Ripper kills only prostitutes. The Axeman and Shotgun Man only killed Italians or Italian Americans under the guise of being assassins for the Mafia. But above that, there's really not much else behind them apart from the fear they evoke. Not even reverential fear, just fear born out of a lack of control. I think there's something in there about the West and their general fear of the absurd, especially with their love for Lovecraftian horror. just It's always something about, oh, can you imagine how terrifying it would be to not have control over a situation that could cost you your life? Like, not to yuck any yums, but that's not terrifying. That's life colonization. <laughs> anyway, since of course reality is stranger than fiction, more often than not, when you put a serial killing urban legend in a story, it loses some of its power by itself. In real life, the idea of being subjected to a situation with a serial killer is terrifying, but when you put a character in that situation, you just go, oh, they should have just done this. Again, with the analytical speculation, you can't outsmart a thing of fiction with more power than you. You can only hope and try to never be at its crosshairs, silly. <laughs> it's the Asian in me being really mad about this. Okay. Well, when put into fiction, the serial killing urban legends tend to take on a life of their own. And I mean that literally. One moment it's just some random monster, the next apparently this boy had a terrible, terrible home life. And oh, the humanity, no wonder he cracked under the pressure. I'm really not for fleshing out villains, if that wasn't obvious enough. <laughs> it's not a generational thing so much as it is a Filipino thing. I'm cautious of people who justify the actions of the guilty to find reason in forgiving the undeniably reprehensible. As always, innocent until proven guilty only works if you don't have actual empirical proof of guilt. 
Serial murder is pretty undeniable. Not only can you prove it, you can trace it from one death to another. There is no moral justification to a string of deaths apart from the need to study it in order to prevent it from happening again. So, maybe there is some reason behind the analytical speculation. My detached fascination with Candyman is rather novel to me in this case. Let me explain. In 1992, Bernard Rose adapted Clive Barker's short story, The Forbidden, from Books of Blood, Volume 5, published in 1988. In The Forbidden, Helen Buchanan is a grad student studying local graffiti in Liverpool's low-income areas, determined to find something grad students before have never found, forge new ground, all that jazz. What she stumbles upon instead are a series of rumors, far-fetched and circumstantial retellings of grisly murders whose perpetrator never seems to be the focus of said rumors. As the story goes, a boy disappears and turns up dead, his mother arrested, and Helen testifies against the fact. Her belief on the rumors wane. She is then visited by Candyman, who tells her that her doubt has displaced him. He entices her to be his next victim, to let the rumors and terrors fester, and she ends up in the neighborhood's annual bonfire with what seems to be the missing boy. If you've watched Candyman, you'll realize the film didn't really alter much from that. Though Candyman is largely absent until the climax of the short story and very much white, the same themes arise. Marginalization, liberalism, the hostile othering of a minority group, and the ghost of communal fiction becoming a very real horror to behold. The film has its own deeper complexities, set in Southside Chicago's Cabrini Green area, with a new and improved backstory for Candyman courtesy of Tony Todd, who was given free reign over the backstory of Daniel Robitaille. In it, Rose and Todd gave context to Candyman's obsession with Helen, effectively saying that his fixation on her isn't entirely incidental. A victim of a lynch mob in the 1890s, Daniel Robitaille used to be an affluent man and skilled artist who fell in love with Helen, who he was commissioned to paint. Interracial couples were pretty much frowned upon, considering, well, American racism. So as the story goes, he was dragged into the streets, had his painting hand cut off, and died drenched in honey, stung to death by bees. It's not an unlikely story, considering, again, American racism. Which is why when Helen Lyle, a grad student from the local university studying semiotics, stumbles upon stories of the Candyman, she takes it upon herself to go down to the Cabrini Green area for some on-field research. Same beats, different themes, but there is one major difference. Helen is more or less hounded by Candyman. The things he does remain within reason, to make her believe in the fear he not only represents, but felt completely in his final moments. He's effectively trauma bonding them so they can be together forever in the afterlife. Sweet. <laughs> Tony Todd's interpretation of Candyman is nothing short of stellar. It became its own cinematic universe, even if the sequels it spawned aren't well known or any good. It's not the essence of Candyman that interests me though, but what he represents. Barker's Candyman is a blunt reminder that an untimely death is about as close to you and your neighbors as it is the drug raids and international conflicts on television. Britain around the 80s was a little too desensitized to war, conflict, and death, as well as entirely blasé about the conflict and death specifically in the lower income areas. It happens every day, in the hands of governments or at the tips of its fingers. And what comes off as a fear born of privilege in the short stories translated perfectly into white fears in the film. And it's so seamless that it took a moment of analyzing to really register in my head. Sophie from Mars did a wonderful analysis of this adaptation choice, which I highly recommend. But in it, they cite that the real reason why classist fears were translated to racist fears is mostly because of the audience impact over the pond. 
it rings true, but I still find it a little odd considering well, it's not like Britain doesn't have a race problem either. <laughs> I just think what's missing in this equation is time. I have a general personal rule of not wanting to go into Western politics in videos as much as I possibly can. <laughs> Mostly because for most of my life and my own country's histories, we've been subjected to knowing about Western politics without our consent. But for the sake of accuracy and this analysis, I'll give it some leeway. The 80s was a time. The end of the Cold War, the beginning of the Iran-Iraq War, and the AIDS epidemic. When I said war, death, and conflict, I meant it. Barker's intention for Candyman was to bring that from across borders to just around the corner. Helen's lack of belief of its existence, regardless of distance and relative peace in the area, is not only naive, but also willfully ignorant. An ignorance born of privileged security, a bubble that needs popping. The horror doesn't lie in her inevitable death, but in the fact that she's willing to remain ignorant in spite of the evidence. Rose and Todd's Candyman is not a vague crime around the block. He is a ghost, one that haunts one with a past, and one most authorities would rather keep buried behind miles and miles of caution tape and uh, CIA brand historical revisionism. White America is very much terrified of retaliation of any kind coming from the people they've colonized, massacred, and enslaved in years past, but not because they think there's a high probability of it happening, but because they think it shouldn't happen in the first place. Like, look, we haven't colonized, massacred, and enslaved anyone in years. Let's just let bygones be bygones. Aren't you glad we aren't openly hostile to your comfort and rights anymore? <sighs> <laughs> On the flip side, Rose and Todd's Candyman was born of an era where slasher horrors were beloved. So the urge to turn some aspect of him likable in spite of his crimes is not surprising. There's a lot there that I can't speak about when it comes to this iteration of Candyman, specifically because A, I'm not American, and B, I'm not black. But... For all intents and purposes, there does come the general misconception of why and for what reason Candyman kills. I mean, this was why the producers were insistent that Bernard Rose meet up with the NAACP before clearing this film. When I said that Bernard Rose stuck very, very close to the short story, though, I meant it. Though the fear-mongering doesn't come from willful ignorance, this time it stems from the same tree of privileged ignorance. And once more... Helen insists on keeping the blinds on. White fear and white saviorism is the heart of this horror film. Candyman is the incessant fear all white people have that despite their good intentions, black people will never accept them. That reverse racism exists. He's nothing but a specter, the ingrate wolf lurking around a terrible, terrible path paved with good intentions. And what's great is that they continue this thread throughout the most recent iteration of this story. The Costas film is beautiful, as is its casting choices, because good lord have you seen Yahya Abdul-Mateen II. <laughs> Saw him in the Watchmen series and he was amazing there too. Nothing but great films under his belt. Moving on. <laughs> the Costas Candyman is a sequel reboot. No ors or end ors. It is both sequel and reboot. This continues the story of Rose and Todd's Candyman while retreading the forbidden and completely ignoring the sequels that came after the initial film, like a fucking legend. <laughs> I have utmost respect for the balls of this production, I am not gonna lie. So if you didn't like the cost as Candyman, do not hope to find a sympathetic ear because I will be singing praises. I'll link you to people who didn't like it, though. I don't mind. The Costa's decision to retread the Forbidden is brilliant. Anthony McCoy replaces Helen Buchanan in this case, a failing artist who likes to turn black pain into his main subject matter. That isn't to say that he doesn't experience racism, but there are still certain privileges he has in his life that makes it so he doesn't experience the majority of his subject matter. To specify, he likes to make art about working-class black pain, 
which he hasn't felt in a long, long while since childhood. His bubble is the class divide and his desire to be an artist people will remember. In other words, gentrification and profiting off of someone else's suffering under the guise of saviorism. Though I am not black, nor American, I can in fact speak to poverty porn in an oppressed community coming from the privileged. Let's step out. The previous Marcos administration, good lord it hurts to say, saw a wave of artists flourishing under Imelda Marcos' guiding hand, and a majority of them, to this day, do not want to bite the hand that fed. Same hand that... I'll let this article do the talking, you can read it in your own time. In all walks of fine art, they flourished. Ballet dancers, theater performers, actors, singers, novelists, the list goes on. All of them have one thing in common. Pleading that the common people be given a chance to flourish in the arts as well as they did. Their subject matter often points to, well, the working class Filipino. Some artists point to farmers, but usually they plead about drivers and sari sari store owners or vendors or simple, simple children living and working in junkyards and settlements. <laughs> I'm not gonna lie, um, you think I'm joking. This is still a thing. Like, I, my mom, um, gets calendars from the company my dad works at, <laughs> and there is always a painting of some poor kid needing new chances or whatever on at least one of those things. It's so... <laughs> it's so trite. It's so ridiculous. And often this rings empty considering, well, these people are rich and often have Spanish or American surnames and maiden names, meaning their family probably owned land before and after the previous Marcos administration. Or their family has been in politics for as long as centralized government has existed in urbanized areas. Or they worked from the ground up but have lost touch with their roots. It's not entirely the same, but you caught what I'm throwing at you, right? Oftentimes, affluent artist types end up becoming a little too overzealous with speaking for the working class, but they never have anything backing those speeches. I am aware that affluent artists aren't to blame for the fact that the working class are a few short bills above the poverty line, or below it, unless they advocated for bills and politicians who actually contributed to that, then, you know, they're definitely to blame. Their out-of-touchness is a symptom of a much bigger disease, but their act of portraying the suffering of the working class to make their own profit while speaking over them is definitely still a problem. It's the out-of-touchness that they actually play up in the Costas iteration of Candyman. The difference between the Helens and Anthony is the fact that he actually has a connection with the thing he's researching but he's uninterested in it. The Helens come from a place of fetishism, wanting to explore these areas and own its idea, its essence, its conquest, territorial in nature, to be able to speak over to people who actually live there, to people who they know in real life who are like the same social class as them. <laughs> Their candymen represent the things they fear once people realize what they actually desire. But Anthony is from Cabrini Green, grew up in Bronzeville, and he's been distancing himself from that to focus on his art, a luxury only a few people where he's from get to indulge in. He wants to connect to his roots, but only for what it could do for him. If it doesn't give him anything, he ignores it. That's why he doesn't fixate on the project, he fixates on its suffering. Like the Helens, he rationalizes the idea of Candyman. They made up stories about him to have their own Carpio the vengeful ghost that will inevitably liberate them from their suffering. The martyrs coming back from the dead in some futile need to gain peace. And what ends up becoming the Costa's Candyman is what Anthony fears will happen if his art doesn't hit the way it's supposed to. As an artist, he wants notoriety and longevity. That's part of the reason Candyman, not Cabrini Green, draws him in. Why his subject matter is always about the suffering and not the people. What he tells the critics is his own justification, but fact of the matter is, the shock of the act and image is what sticks to people's memories, not the people in it. Like in The Forbidden, there is a disinterest in the facts and the fixation on the story. Anthony wants people to remember the story. Not his, necessarily, but it was one he told. One that has his name on it. 
That's why he's so excited when the police mention his artwork on the news, despite the fact that it's connected to someone's death. <laughs> but there's a twistedness to it that is so brilliant, because Anthony is so lost in this idea that he doesn't understand that in the people's fixation on the story, they forgot who was part of it. Because that's the purpose of Candyman. It's just so smart. And they, the way the story fits the message they wanted to send out is... Whew, they made this film before everything during the pandemic happened, of course. But the sentiment remains. One of Black Lives Matter's slogans is to make sure people remember the names, not just the stories. To immortalize them so that even when they bury it under miles and miles of caution tape or CIA levels historical revisionism, people will remember these names and lives forever. I'm not gonna get on any soapbox here, but I do think it's a little sad that people didn't like the Costa's Candyman. Not even just because of the message she wanted to send, but because of how smart it was and how well she adapted and continued this story. I've been through the tail end of people tokenizing the stories I make because I'm not white, and it's... It's not fun. As an artist, you want people to like the things you're telling, not because of your identity, but because of the heart and effort and skill you put into it. And people put the Costas Candyman through the ringer allegedly because it has too many things to say and not enough subtlety in the way it's saying it. Barker wasn't subtle either, and neither were Rose and Todd. But because the Costas Candyman film usually not even credited to her, despite her being a large part of the writing and the look of this film, because the Costas version had a story that was a little too fresh following the footsteps of a few too many black pain films and shows, people don't give it a chance or even give it a deep enough analysis to actually understand what it's doing to the stories it's taking from. It just... it just feels a little sad. Anyway, I... <laughs> That's a lot. I'm not gonna lie. I, I thought the last script was a lot, but that had some little snipes and snippets of me talking off script. This one has 3,400 words, and I had to cut so much of it off because I was getting off topic. So thanks for sticking around. If you enjoy that, subscribing is an option, as well as liking the video, maybe even commenting, I don't know. If you want to support me further... I <laughs> these dogs. <laughs> anyway, if you want to support me further, I also have a Kofi. You'll get early access to uploads, bloopers, links to downloads, or articles I used for research, and more in the Discord if you do. Well, hint, hint. If I pirated something, there's a, there's a high chance I'll be linking it in there. And as always, stay safe. Ingat lahat. Bye!